Let's examine each of the four categories, beginning with students. That which occurred with students following the removal of religious principles was perfectly predicted by George Washington in his farewell address when he said, and let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. Whatever may be conceded to the influence of refined education on minds, reason and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principle. Washington warned that to remove religious principles would be to lose national morality. Notice the accuracy of his warning. This chart shows pregnancies for unwed girls ages 15 through 19. For decades prior to 1962-63, birth rates for unwed teen girls had remained relatively stable. However, with the court's separation of religious principles from students, birth rates for unwed girls have now increased every year since 1962-63. This chart represents pregnancies for high school girls, but even birth rates for girls 10 through 14 years old have increased 553% since the removal of religious principles. This is a strong correlation. Perhaps it's merely coincidental, but it is both complete and striking. It is further significant to note that every moral measurement which exists for students breaks violently upward with the separation of religious principles from the lives of students in 1962-63. Notice this category, sexually transmitted diseases to high school students. Notice how low sexually transmitted diseases had been. Notice the point when religious principles were prohibited. Notice a dramatic increase. The same is true for every moral measurement among youth. Again, each of these categories was showing overall declines prior to 1962-63, but with the first ever separation of religious principles from students, a violent upturn occurred on every chart and in every moral measurement. Washington was correct. The next category over which God was acknowledged in that simple prayer, and in which the courts had maintained the use of biblical principles prior to 1962, was that of our families, or our parents. What happened when we abandoned the use of God's principles when dealing with families? Consider the area of divorce. Statistically, the divorce rate had been steadily declining for years and even decades prior to 1962-63. Beginning in 1963, the divorce rate skyrocketed. The United States has now become number one in the world in the rate of divorce. It is again striking that every measurement related to the breakup of the family statistically skyrocketed in 1963 with the separation of biblical principles from public policy. Single parent families are now up 140%. Single parent families with children are now up 160%. Even family morality is dramatically different. Unmarried couples living together are now up 536%. Again, each of these categories had been stable for years prior to 1962-63, and then the dramatic increases correlate exactly to the court's rejection of those standards which had been applied to the family for 170 years previously. The third category in which God's assistance was petitioned was our schools. What happened when we barred God and his principles from our schools? The SAT test, the Scholastic Aptitude Test, is an excellent indicator. The SAT test has been in America since 1926, and in 1941 it was placed on the same scale that is still used today. Prior to 1963, there were never more than two consecutive years where the scores either rose or declined, but beginning in 1963, Scores plummeted for 18 consecutive years, unprecedented. Scores are now so low that the Department of Education states that this is the first time in America's history that we are graduating out a generation of students who academically know less than their parents did. The SAT test is the same test their parents used. It's been the same since 1941, yet there is nearly an 80-point difference between the two generations. In 1962, there were only 1,000 Christian schools in the nation. But once it became obvious that things like prayer, Bible, and the Ten Commandments would be forbidden, there was a marked explosion in the number of religious and particularly Christian schools. By 1984, the number of Christian schools had burgeoned to 32,000 schools. Currently, 8.5 million students, approximately 12% of the student population, attends private religious schools. According to the board responsible for the SAT test, the scores of students from private schools are nearly 80 points higher than those from public schools, which places them at the same level of scores prior to 1962-63. For private religious schools, it's as if no change had ever occurred. But for public schools, their scores are still continuing to decline. Another indicator of the impact that religious principles and religious schools have had on American education is found in the academic cream of the crop, the nation's academic elite, the national merit semifinalists. These are the top one-half percent of the nation's students. Now, according to the Department of Education, 
12.4% of the nation's students attend private religious schools. 87.6% attend public schools. Since 12% of the nation's students attend private religious schools, private religious schools should produce 12% of the nation's cream of the crop. And 88% of the nation's students in public schools should produce 88% of the nation's cream of the crop. Yet that is not what is occurring. For example, in recent testing, that little group of 12.4% of the nation's students from private religious schools was producing 39.2% of the nation's top academic scholars. That's a level three times larger than its size. That's a phenomenal differential. We showed these statistics to a U.S. congressman. He looked at them and stated, that makes perfect sense to me, he said. He said, when you're talking about private schools, you're talking about money. You're talking affluency. He said private schools ought to get better scores than public schools. We investigated to see if that would be true and found that according to the Department of Education, the average private school costs $2,200 per student, while the average public school costs $5,400 per student. Private schools with two-fifths of funds are proportionally turning out a percentage of academic scholars three times higher than public schools. But consider, what is the fundamental difference between public and private schools? It is not in the core curriculum. The curriculum is the same. The Civil War takes place the same year at both schools. Math is the same at both schools. A verb is not an adjective simply because someone transfers to a private religious school. The basic difference is that one school utilizes religious principles and one does not, which appears to make an 80-point difference on the SAT test. The final category, the fourth category, was our country. What happened in the nation when we separated religious principles from public arenas? Well, what do you think happens when you start telling students, you can't see the Ten Commandments, you might obey them, things like don't steal and don't kill? That has to have an effect on behavior. It did. Washington, in yet another warning from his farewell address, accurately predicted what has occurred. He said, let it simply be asked, where is the security for life, for reputation, and for property if the sense of religious obligation desert? The sense of religious obligations has deserted, and currently there now seems to be no security for life, for reputation, or for property. For example, consider violent crime. After having remained statistically stable for years, since the removal of religious principles in 1962, the number of violent crimes has now surpassed population growth by 794%, causing the United States to become the world's leader in violent crime. Perhaps the best explanation for this increase was given by Thomas Jefferson, who succinctly states why Christianity was the best friend to government. Jefferson explained, the precepts of philosophy laid hold of actions only, but Jesus pushed his scrutinies into the heart of man. He erected his tribunal in the region of his thoughts, and he purified the waters at the fountainhead. Where the law says, don't kill, in Matthew 5, Jesus says, don't get angry, don't hate. Clearly, if you prevent the anger and the hate, you've prevented the murder. Where the law says, don't commit adultery, Jesus says, don't lust in your heart. If you control the lust, you've controlled the adultery. The founders pointed out that only religion could stop crime before it started, because all crime comes out of the heart, and if you can't control the heart, you can't control crime. That is why Christian principles were so valuable to government. Most of the founders expressed this same understanding. President John Adams pointed out that there was no government in the world able to make someone do what was right or able to control those who did not wish to be controlled. Adams explained, we have no government armed with power capable of contending with human passions unbridled by morality and religion. Then notice what he said. Our constitution was made only for a moral and a religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. The